Uh, welcome to uh, today's webinar. I've, uh, of course, I'm James Gerrish, who's the author of Market Matters. I'm also a um, portfolio manager uh, here at Shore and Partners. Um, I'm joined today by uh, Danny Eunice, who's one of our senior analysts. It's, uh, it's great to have um, Danny here. I am going to share my screen um, in just a moment so you can um, start to see what we're talking about and get some context around um, our rationales, etc. So, you know, Danny's been at Shaw for, I think, 10 years 10 now. years, almost to the day. So. E exactly right. So I've worked with Danny for uh, six or seven years. Um, you know, I rate Danny as, a, as, a, as an analyst. Um, he's, um, you know, I, I often lean on him for his uh, views around markets, particularly around the retail space and others, which we're going to talk about um, today. So it's great to have Danny um, on board for today's um, webinar. It is just gone on four. We've got, um, I think, most attendees. So um, I believe we're um, running running um, uh, in terms of sound and all that is uh, is good. So once again, thanks for joining us. And today I'll frame the web the webinar around um, the future of retail. It's been a really, um, you know, it's been a hugely interesting time, in, particularly in a retail space. I don't think I've um, seen a period which has been so volatile in terms of uh, retail. I'm gonna get your thoughts on it, but I'm just gonna quickly start sharing my screen, Danny, to give some context um, around um, the market um, and around things from here. Well, before I crack on, I think um, uh, all attendees should be able to see um, a, uh, a quick um, sharing of my screen there. The ASX um, 200 is on the um, screen uh, in front of you there. So um, just in terms of the market, it's been an interesting session today. The market, as we've been writing about, is still keen to that 6,000 um, handle on the ASX 200. We've been in this range-bound market for about six to eight weeks, etc. So there hasn't been a huge amount of impetus to move the market in either way. I think, you know, we've written about it a lot in recent times. You know, the resilience of the market is actually a reasonably positive thing. We sort of tweaked our uh, rhetoric in the AM note this morning, just around being a little bit short term cautious. Um, the fact that yesterday's move closed down well off the session highs and today we've seen a similar scenario play out. So I'm a little bit cautious um, just in the very short term, but given the weight of money that's um, obviously being thrown at um, the market and thrown at stimulus, et cetera, we remain overall bullish. But we're not here to talk just about the market. We're here to talk um, about um, retail stocks. I'm gonna put a, um, just to give you some context around what's happened um, in the retail uh, landscape um, just in the last um, little while, because because retail sales have actually been a really, it's a, it's a really interesting um, chart when I can get it. Retail sales. It's a really interesting chart when I can get it on your screen, because I think this um, you know, speaks to the volatility we've seen in the retail space at the moment. Um, Danny, you know, the impact of COVID on retail has been huge. It's been you know, huge across the broader market. Um, you know, what are you seeing here? In today's presentation, we want to talk about what's going on in the online space, yep. whether that's been yep. a trend that's been amplified through yep. COVID. So you know, what are you seeing in the retail landscape from a high level perspective, first yep. of all? So pre-COVID, we had a number of imbued trends within the retail space that were slow to accelerate and slow to gain traction and slow for retailers to execute. So it was those shifts that you were seeing. So it was the shift onto online. It was the shift onto the omni-channel, which is using online physical bricks and mortar and other avenues, such as loyalty or social media sales, et cetera. It was things like the trend from branded products into private label. It was the trend of customers being more focused in terms of what they spend and the value proposition that retailers uh, provide to these customers. But then COVID hit and a lot of these trends have been super accelerated. So it's been a positive or a negative depending on which retailer you are. And the retailers that tend, tended to have struggled over the last three months since COVID hit are those with the old model. So, you know, it's, it's those that don't have a big online channel, or don't have a big private label capacity or have very high operating expenses or are locked into five to 10, 15, even 20 year uh, rental contracts. Um, COVID has really accelerated and really separated the wheat from the chaff. So those that are in online or predominantly online 
tend to have done extremely well, and that is represented by the share prices in the last three months. There's so, been some phenomenal. Oh, absolutely. So like... in the top 10 in the last three months, you know, you've got Kogan, you've got Temple and Webster, you've got MMM, which is Marley Spoon, pre-made food. Um, and you've got one other one which fails me at the moment. We, uh, even the big guys. So even you look at JB, which has gone yeah. from 21 to 45. Yep. You look at, um, but then you, 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 you look on the other side of the ledger and see something like a Kathmandu who nearly went out the back door. Yeah. A during, Levisa, during for example, Levisa who didn't really have a big struggle. online and, you know, who have actually gone backwards in the last three months and pulling out of international territories like Spain. So those that were predominantly online, as the names that I mentioned, plus those that have accelerated their online investment over the last three years, you know, the likes of Adairs, the likes of City Chic, the likes of Shaver Shop, have all done extremely well in that last three months. So it's investing ahead of the curve. One of the things that I've noticed, it's not just about being online, it's about okay. being online properly and having the, you know, the, the infrastructure behind it to deliver the online yeah. experience and deliver the service to customers, even though it's, yeah. You, know, you don't have those bricks and mortar. Temple and Webster is a really interesting one, which we'll get onto later. Yeah. So I don't want to go onto that um, just yet. So I guess I, what I wanted to frame around this webinar today, I wanted to start big and end yeah. um, a little bit smaller. Yeah. So you know, if you think about you know, big in the Australian landscape, yeah. um, we think supermarkets, yeah. and they've actually been a pretty interesting um, case study during so, COVID. Obviously, yeah. they've been supported by huge amounts of um, stockpiling of staples, yeah. etc. cetera. Yeah. But there's more, there's an online angle to um, the supermarkets yeah. at the moment. You know, what do you, so, you know, how much are they doing now online? And what yeah. are they, what's the scope going forward from yeah. the supermarkets? So, so retail spending in Australia, TAM, the addressable market, is roughly, depending on which source you use, 350 to about 400 billion annual turnover. Okay, that's total retail sales of that. Of that, roughly a quarter is grocery or supermarket channel sales. So it's about 110 billion. And within that componentry, you've got two big players, Woolworths and Coles, who are roughly 75% of that spend. So it's say $80 billion of that 110 is Woolworths and Coles. Mm. Now on the, la on the latest figures, Woolworths is about 43, 44%, Coles is in, in the mid thirties. And then you've got a big gap between those two and, and Aldi. Aldi's at 15%, still doing very well. It's taken them, tw they've been in Australia now for 20 years, got to 15%. Um, at one third the earnings of, of Woolworths, for example, and then you've got all the independents. Okay, so online right now, as a percentage of that $110 billion, is relatively small. And this is a global phenomenon, it's not just limited to Australia. So, in the US and in Europe and in the UK, as is in Australia, it's currently less than 5% of turnover. Why, why is that? Is it so? There's a couple of things. So, the first one is the supermarket operators have been really they haven't wanted to invest in online because they've been investing in their big physical bricks and mortar store. So Woolworths has 1,020 supermarkets, okay? Coles has about 830. That's on top of all the bottle shops. So it's a massive capital intensive and capital heavy business model. So, mm. and those stores need continual refurbishment every you know, three to three to seven years, depending on where the store is. So there hasn't been a lot, a lot of funds left over for online. And, the belief here in Australia, particularly amongst supermarket providers was, the margins are already too low in Australia in supermarkets. In fact, on a global basis, they're very high. Woolworths is doing 4.5% EBIT margins. Coles is doing about 37 Globally, if you look at the Tesco's, the Kroger's, the Walmart's, they're all sub 3% margin. So the margins are already very, very skinny. Mm. Problem with online is, number one, you're not as engaged with your customer because you can't get them into the store and they can't make discretionary spend or impulse buying, which increases their average well, that's transaction. The and online is to get people to make those impulse yep. buys. And without the scale, they end up being lost leaders. So it wasn't until Coles and Woolworths got a billion dollars in annual sales on the, from online that they've actually started breaking even on that. So the they're been losing just, money on, on correct. online. Correct. So, so that has been the issue. And that's not only limited to Coles and Moores, it's a global issue as well, okay? So where it's really exacerbated in Australia is our fragmentation and dispersion of geography, okay? Unlike in the US with 50 states where it's easy to get a third party logistics operator or transport operator to ship, you know, same day, which is what Amazon is trying to do in the US. Here it's much more difficult because, you know, you've got the Eastern Seaboard and the Western Seaboard and there's a big, big hole really in the middle. So to offer that sort of same day delivery, 
it's really, really difficult because it costs you a lot of money and there's no guarantees that you can do it. And that's the problem I think Amazon is going to have with Whole Foods if they were to look in Australia. The other issue about online retail is when you, when you talk about retailers generically, it's really about being customer focused. So being customer focused is really about being engaged with your customer consistently. It's being customer relevant. So you've got to provide them with the goods that they want, not the goods that you think that they want, which has been an issue for some of the DDSs, the discount department stores like uh, Big W, Meyer, and Target over the last few years. And you need to be relevant to them. And those that aren't relevant, like the Myers and the David Jones, are either standing still or going backwards. Yep. So in terms of the what it takes to make money out of um, you know, retailing online, particularly in the grocery space, you know, the, the level of investment that's got to go on, you, you just talked about the level of investment supermarkets have been making yep. in terms of their bricks and mortar. But what is it? Is it is it is the prize good? Is the prize worth doing it? Look, I I sit back here and we talk about all, you know, the easy scenario is online doesn't have um, you know, all the costs that are associated with having a big yeah. bricks and mortar present. But then you've still got distribution, you've still got the logistics networks, you've still got, so is it a long, you know, is it a long-term thematic or what's Absolutely. The I, look, there's no doubt this is the way to go. First of all, you're seeing a mindset change in, in the consumer market who want more convenience, who want more fluidity, you know, in terms of doing things whenever they want 24 seven. Okay, they don't wanna be locked down to, you know, a, a, an 8 a.m. till 6 p.m. supermarket trip. So it's being driven by the consumer. That's the first point. Second point is Woolworths and Coles are both investing roughly, give or take 100 million, a billion dollars each over the next few years yeah. to increasingly automate and roboticize their distribution of fulfillment centers. That is absolutely crucial because the third piece of the puzzle is you need scale. So there's no doubt the trend is going more and more towards this. There's no doubt it's been driven by consumer convenience. There's no doubt the investment is being done now. They are thinking long-term and strategically because that is the way the global market is heading and Australia is, is following on that. And the margins eventually will come because as you would know, if you're between Woolworths and Coles, just in their supermarkets, there's 2,000 of them between the two of them. You know, it's a massive cost in terms of rents. It's a massive cost in terms of penalty rates and labour costs. It's a massive cost in terms of gas, etc. Online will remove a significant chunk of most of that. How do you think about Metcash in the in the mix? What I'm getting from you is that the big in you know online and having these distribution networks, the big get bigger. What about the you know, the third player in the space? Well. Metcash actually did it a little earlier. So three years ago, they were looking at their Huntingwood facility and automating that facility well ahead before Woolworths. Woolworths and Coles were really forced to do it in the last 12 months. And they're really playing catch up with Metcash. And you'll remember during the peak COVID between March and early March, when it, when, it, when it really started to make a significant impact, both Coles online and Woolworths online both went down. It didn't have the capacity to deal with the demand that was coming through. So they were left behind. So. Metcash were actually two years ago, they started automating their fulfillment centers out in Western Sydney, and they should be a beneficiary going forward. Of course, as you know, it's a different sort of model. It's a wholesale yeah. model, and the margins are skinnier there. So it's even more imperative for someone like Metcash, who are on thinner margins, to really accelerate that, that trend further into automation, robotics, uh, you know, pick and collect, etc. So just you know, um, distilling that those views down around the supermarket space. What's your what's your take on stocks in the in the space? Yeah. Um, Woolies, Coles, Metcash. Yeah. So um, and West Farm, if you want, and West Farmers yeah. as well, obviously. So I think right now they've been massive beneficiaries of COVID. You talked about it in your introductory comments. Who's been a beneficiary? It's those that are in food or grocery with convenience offerings, which is Woolworths and Coles. It's that those that are in home improvement or do it yourself, i.e. the Bunnings and the office works and the work from home aspect. It's those that are in electronics, i.e. you know, that's still exposed to Big W, Target and Kmart. And it's those in health, you know, Woolworths and Coles are putting more and more health and wellbeing products, which is a key driver in the consumer. So the big beneficiaries before COVID were those supermarket operators. Post COVID, it's only embedded and augmented their offering and it's made them even more important. So who do I like? Look, I still like Woolworths. Okay, I think pre or post COVID, it's going to continue to do well. Same with Coles. Coles is my preference because it's a capital, a lighter capital model and intensity that they've put because in. Because of logistics? Because of logistics, because of smaller store footprint. Um, and fundamentally, it's a leaner business than, say, Woolworths is, okay, which is why Woolworths is looking to split out its hotels business and it's looking to split out its, its liquor business as well. Um, IGA slash Metcash. 
One of the other areas where they're ahead of the curve there is in private label branding. So that's an area with black and gold, et cetera, where they've done really, really well as well. So uh, that's probably my third proposition uh, or third investment recommendation. And West Farmers, West Farmers is a, a different kettle of fish because it's in a different area, but fundamentally West Farmers is a fantastic business that is driven predominantly by Bunnings, which yep. is more than 60% of their, their earnings now. Office Works is also being a benef massive benefit or beneficiary of the work from home um, issue as well. So really three quarters of the business is firing. The issue where they have is Kmart, which is arguably the best of the three DDSs, discount department stores, but it has sort of come off in the last two to three years in terms of sales. And that's largely a function of Target and Big W, which was owned by Woolworths, mm. ramping up and improving and transitioning their business models. Look, the argument longer term is why I'm not as positive on, on West Farmers as I am on Woolworths and Coles is, is because it has that exposure to target where it's losing roughly, you know, 100 to $150 million a year. Um, the, the longer term issue is what do they do with it? Do they roll it completely into Kmart? Do they demerge it out with Kmart and Catch Group? Or do they look at other options? So that's the difficulty they have. West the, other, the other things, obviously, they're um, looking to expand in their industrials. Correct. Region. So, yeah. you know, they've got a war chest of cash, yeah. West Farmers. Arguably, they wished, you know, they would, they would have been one of the stocks or companies that would have wished that COVID had have gone on, yeah. um, you know, longer yeah. from, a, from an opportunity set yeah. perspective. But they've done a few interesting things. So, you're right, industrials, chemicals, energy, fertiliser are big areas, and that's, that's about 20% of their earnings. Yeah. Very, very high margins. They tend to be, you know, 25 to 30% margins as opposed to your, 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 your Bunnings, which is about 10%, or your Office Works, which is 7 8%. Retail in general is far more competitive, which is why you have those lower margins. So not only does chemical energy fertilizers and industrials have higher margins, but much higher return on capital employed. In the case, for example, of um, the CEF business, chemicals, energy, fertilizers, the returns can be as high as 50% of the capital outlaid or capital invested. So that is why West Farmers historically and traditionally is very strong in that area and I think will remain in that area. What they've also done is they've seen the online trend, which is why they made that acquisition of Catch Group. Okay. And there's now talk in the market that they want to beef up or augment that online offering. You know, there was an article in today's paper about Chemist Warehouse, for example. You know, that would be a, a fantastic bolt-on for someone like West Farmers because they know retail. It's got a very strong online um, uh, a channel plus it's very exposed to that whole high net worth Asia market as well, particularly with Chinese Daigus, etc., who buy Australia's health and well being products. All right, so summing up the supermarkets in terms of um, key picks, Woolies is it, but you know, like the, my takeaway is that the big get bigger in this Correct. space, and there's not it's not as easy as just simply going and putting an online offering, you've got to have the um, yeah, you've got to have the investment capability to, to, to deliver on it, absolutely. Um, Let's move on to the second area I want to look around is discretionary um, retailers. It's a big part of the market. Um, there's areas that we've touched on before, Temple and Webster, um, you know, Kogan, who have just been absolutely phenomenal in yeah. this space. Yeah. Um, and not only phenomenal in terms of what the share price has done, but you know, phenomenal in terms of how wrong the market got it coming into March and where they um, sold stocks off to um, in that much period. But I just want to, you touched on, um, Danny, you touched on Amazon. Um, you touched on Amazon. I'll just get a chart so that everyone can see um, what we're looking at in terms of Amazon and the concept of the big getting bigger. So Amazon is the biggest company in the world. It started 2020, uh, capped at about a trillion dollars. Um, it's now um, capped around $1.5 trillion. So, you know, a trillion dollar business growing 50% um, in the course of the, uh, of the year. If I go back and, you know, if you look at the, the revenue numbers are simply phenomenal in terms of Amazon. They're doing $280 billion worth of revenue. They're going to do something like 400 next year. Like it's, you know, the growth is absolutely phenomenal. So, you know, that concept of big getting bigger. How does Amazon, look, what does Amazon look like in Australia and how much of a threat is Amazon to all of these players that are sort of, um, you know, see the, 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 the flashing lights of online yeah. and want to get in that? Yeah, the, the short answer is it's a different kettle of fish, okay? We, Amazon in the US is, is absolutely a harbinger, harbinger of things to come. The technology they stack using AI, all that sort of stuff is absolutely amazing. And the so they're the, they're, they're, they are just so far yeah, ahead. Absolutely. So here in Australia, they announced their intention to come into Australia two years ago, and it's been a, a gradual accretion in terms of their footprint here. So 
the Amazon Australia website right now and the offering they have here in Australia is really only a marketplace offering. So by that, I mean they only have third-party sellers on their platform. Yeah. It's a bit like what Kogan's trying to do now. They're replicating that model. Which is here. a lower margin. Lower margin, no control over pricing, no control over your customers. Okay, so you're effectively a conduit to other sellers. Now, Amazon themselves, in terms of putting their own inventory on their own platform, is still probably 12 to 24 months away. Okay, so you're really not in going Australia. in Australia. So you're really not going to see them ramp up until that until such time that that happens. And that is why really a lot of Australian retailers have had the last two years to really get their online offering intact, which is what they've done. You know, some of the names we mentioned earlier, you know, the, um, the, the Adairs, for example, the JB Hi-Fi's, the Harvey Normans, the uh, Levisas to a lesser extent, City Chic, which has been phenomenal. Um, Shaver Shop, which is, which is now 40% of their, their online business as a percentage of turnover. So that has really changed. That's grown. Yeah, that, that's grown Historic, huge in the last two years. Yeah. Australian retailers in the last five years have averaged between 8 to 10% of their turnover in online. For, the, for all the, the names that have ramped up in the yeah. last 12 months, that's more than double. During COVID, a lot of them have gone to 30 to 40% of their turnover has been online. So there's been a massive ramp up. And it's shown that their systems and technology stack could cope with that level of demand. So I, I look at on the on the screen there is Temple and Web Three. I've yep. got it labelled on the on the chart there. It shows that we haven't been involved in the stock, which is obviously <laughs> a, a big shame. But Temple and Web Three, this isn't a new business. This has been around for a long time. It was one of the dogs of 2016. It was the wor one of the worst IPOs. Um, they listed, I think, from memory at a dollar ten. They traded as low as twelve cents. Um, and they've only, you know, in, in March they were trading um, down there at a dollar fifty low. They're now trading at eight dollars the guy the same the same co-founder yeah. is running this business Mark Coulter, yeah. yeah so what's the so what do you learn from a business yeah, it's, it's, like that i mean it's, it's not only that homeware yep. it's, it's obviously homewares etc yeah. online yeah but so, i can't get my head around how that business has changed there's a few things so it's not only temple and webster that had a, an appalling track record when it had ipo look at the other two online has begun on red bubble the online t-shirts business again that was dismissed when it first listed and look how it's done. And the other one was obviously Kogan. You know, Kogan came onto the market with 2% margins, incredibly skinny margins. And look how they've turned that business around. You know, 50% of their business in there. So there's a few lessons to be learned from this. Why particular Temple and Webster to answer your question? Look, I know the furniture space pretty well because I covered Nick Scarley for, for, for nearly 10 years. And I previously covered Fantastic Furniture before it was acquired by Steinoff. I believe that's coming back to market at some point if it's not taken out by uh, yeah. one of the other players. There's a few lessons here. Number one, it's all about white labeling and private labels. So Temple and Webster were very early in on that trend. Okay, So it's effectively getting furniture um, from Asian nations really cheaply, whacking your own name on it, and putting a big margin on it. That's all it is. Okay, So that sort of private labeling has worked really well from that mid market, mid to low market here with Australia's residential uptick in apartments, new builds and refurbs has really driven Temple and Webster the last three years. So they're right, the timing was perfect for them. It's huge. You look at the you look at the revenue they were doing and yeah. so even so FY nineteen, they did revenue of hundred and one million. Um, you know, in FY um, where are we? In twenty they're gonna do two hundred and they're gonna do hundred and seventy five in yeah. FY. 20 they're going to do 259 in in, in 21 on these numbers and 340 and growing to 480 which is a pie in the sky number there's one analyst with that 480 number but it goes to show you the huge level of correct um you know growth available to it and i guess just to just to show um viewers that um that on a big scale in terms of what amazon does and how powerful a business like amazon is um, yeah, you know, I said before, 19 revenue is 280. 20 revenue is going to be 350. This is a billion dollars. Um, you know, 412 in 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 21. So the power of it, scale, and the sort of the That's winner the takes all mentality in online as well as in the technolo te te technology. Plus the sector with, itself. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly right. And the, the sector is driven that as well. But yeah. is that you know you, we talk about Temple and Webster being in the right sector, but is that a short term thematic? So. You know, homewares online, are we getting driven? Like, is the market got well ahead of itself bidding Temple and Webster? In this it? case, I would say, given Australia's obsession with re, uh, residential, particularly, you know, new builds, apartment dwellings, homes, etc., this is likely to be a long term, longer term trajectory because people are continually reinvesting in their properties, 
whether it be apartments or homes or houses, townhouses, terraces, whatever it is. And we've seen that trend over the last 10 years. You could put up the same chart for Nick Scarley, for example. Yeah. Really high margins, 62% gross margins consistently. And that's what they're doing. The other, the corollary of these providers is they're not only now providing lounges and couches, they're moving into other adjacent ancillary areas, like your, your corner rug or your corner coffee table, and which are also very high margins. So they're giving you the complete package, okay? What Temple and Webster have done really well and what other players have done really well is they're staying away from that commoditized part of mm. the furniture market, which is, you know, things like sofas and that can be easily shipped flat packed out of China really cheaply at low margin. So they're so focusing fantastic. on that. They're, 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 they're listing, aren't they? Yeah, correct. They're coming back to the market yeah. at some point if there's no trade sale. And yeah, they have a sofas business as well, which when they were listed didn't perform very well. Um, so they've been very smart about who they target. And it's the complete opposite of all the other furniture players. They've really owned the, the, the home and furniture space mm. because Nick Scarley have always said, we don't want to be online. Fantastic furniture have been subpar. These guys are specifically targeted online and those that, that are amenable to convenience. So what about Nick Scarley? Nick scarley has been producing some really strong numbers. Yeah. So, you know, are they moving online or what's the, what's the, what's, what, what is it about Nick Scarley? The, the, difficulty, the difficulty online is something that Amazon highlighted three, four years ago. And that is if, you know, a $5,000 couch it's a significant logistical exercise to deliver that couch. Now, if it's injured en route, or if, if, there, if there's an issue with it when it's delivered, or the customer's not happy, happy, it's a massive cost to have it sent back. That's why Koala the, did so well. Correct. How to get mattresses to you yeah. in a, in a, you know, it was all about the logistics yeah. side. So you, you, need, you need a fulfillment center and you need a distribution center that can cater to a, a wide geography, which is what Temple and Webster done because they've invested in that. Nick Scarley don't want to do that because the cost is too prohibitive on ter in terms of returns, in terms of shrinkage, all those sorts of issues. Yeah, and I guess that's why they're trading at you know, a multiple of 15, 16 times Correct. first, um, you know, and, and growing it. Um, you know, mid-single to high, you know, single digit growth rather than the um, 20, 30% that some of the onlines are doing here. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Kogan. So, you know, this has been a phenomenal yeah. um, business. I don't want to focus on, we're going to touch on other areas that have done um, that may not have run as far as these. But, you know, I, I sit back and look at a, a stock that's gone from $8 down to three forty-five. It's, um, you know, rallied up to 16 $18 even during... Um, the last, um, you know, in the last couple of weeks, it's hard from an investment standpoint to get your head around the, you know, what drives something like that. So obviously, top line growth is yeah. phenomenal, yeah. And you need to grow. I've, I've, I've often looked at the, um, what do they say? The rule of forty. As long as your revenue is growing plus your EBITDA margin is combined yeah. above forty, that's yeah. a really solid business. Yeah. Um, and that's what these guys have been able to do. Yeah, so where Ruslan, and he's done a phenomenal job, I've got to say, where he's been really successful is not just becoming another online retailer. Okay, so that was because his margins were very skinny when they first listed, and that's all they were, an online retailer. So that was the first thing. So they're two, three percent margins. Then he moved further and further into private label, you know, Kogan brand, other yeah. brands, etc. Okay. Went into other categories like health and new well-being and you know, those high margin things where there's a really uh, another captive audience in that high spending female demographic, particularly between the ages of 18 to 30 who spend a lot of money. So he's captured that audience as well. But the master stroke, which is really going to not only improve his top line, but really push his margins beyond that 2 3% historically is that he's moved into other vertical channels mm. so he's, in, he's now able to cross like insurance mobile yeah. um, personal yeah, yeah. loans cars he's going to all these other now there's a view in the market that we don't know what, what this business is going to look like in the next two years if he can execute on all those channels but certainly if he can get it right that's one of the fundamental reasons why the market is putting this on a PE of you know 40 50 times forward earnings yeah because of that potential accretion he can get in earnings and margin improvement over the next two to three years out of these vertical channels that he's entering into. So look, that's the, I mean, that's the thing, the concept around what you should be paying for a, a business like this. So, you know, if you look at Kogan and look at the um, revenue growth that it's um, generating over the last um, you know, little while and what it's going to be doing in the, the outer years. So um, you, you rightly said, Danny, it's on a P of around 50 next year, which is not that, onerous when you think about Temple and Webster. Correct. You know, that's or red bubble. Or red bubble or all yeah. of that. So, 
you know, and, and the, it, it's, if they deliver, it can be significantly bigger than that. Obviously. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I think there's definitely momentum in terms of the, the strategy that, that, that they've implemented and that, that will continue. Online is not going to, to, to go away soon. And right now, they're only on the cusp also of the trajectory that they potentially could take in this market. We've seen JB Hi-Fi and Harvey Norman, because electronics is one of the biggest subsectors in terms of category spending in the mm. discretionary area. And they're trying to replicate that model now. And where Kogan has been very smart is he's trying to adopt an Amazon model that I alluded to earlier, and that is to, to have a marketplace offering yeah, as well. Yeah, where everybody, correct. Yeah. yeah. So he's been very smart in being a complete 360 holistic retail offering, which is basically a replica of the Amazon model. How do you say so the numbers on the screen there, just so that yeah. um, those viewers are, uh, can understand what we're seeing is, you know, the, the, the growth numbers over the um, coming years. So this is consensus analyst expectations. This isn't um, Danny's numbers. This is what the market collectively is thinking for Kogan. And I look at revenue growth there at 16% out for the next three years. Yeah. How much is, I mean, analysts are having a stab in the dark in terms of that. The business could look like anything in yeah. three years. So yeah. I guess that's the really hard part about valuing a company like this. And I guess that's why, you know, at the start of the year, I was looking at Amazon and we yeah. had a, we did a webinar on, um, some of these large softs that we really liked. Amazon was one of them. We didn't pull the trigger and buy it simply because of the valuation. But you've sort of got to step to one side around about around yeah. valuations. It's hard to get your head around that. From It is. And we're really, really what drives it is the top line. When you look at retailers in general, and we're talking pre-COVID here, most discretionary retailers grow mid single digits to high single digits year on year. So five to 10% is really the typical growth rate you would expect from a discretionary retailer, as opposed to a supermarket who grows three, three to five percent per annum. When you see numbers, you know, in the double digits, you know, 15 to 20% like Kogan's generating, that's why it generates a high multiple. The market re-rates that and, and attributes a significant premium because of that performance. Now, of course, the corollary or the mitigant to that is it needs to continually drive that those double digit rates historically and, and into the future. Which is harder to do. Which is harder to do. So there's several things that they do. The first one is they make acquisitions. Or is it harder to do though? So you think about when you like you think about the supermarkets making investments yeah. into um, the you know online capabilities, distribution, yeah. etc. Doesn't that then underpin the ability to grow strongly in the future? It does. But the advantage that, that a Kogan has over, say, a supermarket is it doesn't have the store footprint. Mm. It doesn't have the rental um, loggerheads and dealings that they have to deal with. It doesn't have the huge staff overheads that, that, that are a supermarket offer. So they're already in a benef beneficial position by virtue of the fact that they're 100% online. And that's how you see. And, I mean, Kogan made a small acquisition, Matt Blatt. Um, yeah, bought the brand, closed yep. down all the stores, correct. Um, and it's just going to use yeah brand and and, and product and sell it online. Yeah. And that was the smart thing to do. I mean, one of the key telling points about Australian retailers is their push offshore. Very, very few Australian retailers have succeeded offshore. As I said earlier, La Visa have just shut down their Spanish operations. Previously, we had Oriton moving offshore. It was a disaster. Um, there are exceptions. Premier Investments, which is a fantastically run company, have done very well with Smiggle and Peter Alexander in the UK and in Asia, but it's, they're few and far between. The advantage of online is there are no geographical barriers. Yeah. So you, you, you just touched on, um, Tim, on um, Premier Investments. So I'll, I'll put a chart of, of, of that up. We know Premier has obviously been, um, Solomon Liu has obviously been um, pretty vocal around um, how landlords should be paid going forward. Retail landlords, yeah. big shopping centres, effectively saying that he was going to um, stop paying rent, which I believe he did, yeah. and that the landlord should actually wear some of the upside or the risk, at least the downside. I'm not so sure about the upside in retailing and shopping centres. Right. What's your take on, um, you know, the... the we're digressing, I know, but all this talk of online yeah. and how businesses grow yeah. doesn't speak well for, for, for malls, for retail sure. malls, etc. Correct. So the two most exposed REITs in terms of shopping centres are Vicinity and yeah. Centre Group. Okay, they're the two most exposed. I mean, you can just look at, for example, what West Farmers are doing with Target. Um, 30 of those 150-odd Target stores are uh, centre stores and another 20 
are probably in vicinity centres. So 50 out, a third are in the, just in those two. So you're absolutely right. And the vicinity, just so those listening, vicinity are more exposed in regional areas. Yeah. Um, centre group is more, you know, high quality, um, yeah. uh, you know, CBD places. So, so it's okay for Solly Loon from Premier Investments to say he's not going to pay rent, he's going to shut his stores, because he's actually got clout in terms of hundreds of stores. He's the biggest retail he's, he's, Yeah, so outside of the, the supermarkets. Yeah. He's, yeah, Sorry, it's two, it's yeah. over 2,000 stores he's got. So he has that power and ability to do that, okay? Because he's basically in every major shopping mm. centre in Australia. The flip side of that is we've spoken to a lot of smaller retailers who only have footprints of 100 or so. So your niche retailers tend to have 100 to 150 stores. Mm they're finding it much more difficult in having those negotiations with landlords. So a lot of them are still on the same rents that they were on last year, even though they've had to close stores or their, 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 their business in physical bricks and mortar has dropped 30, 40, 50% during March, April. Yeah. Okay. So classic example is Shaver Shop, which has really turned the business around in the last two years. They're, they're finding it more difficult to get those rental reductions and say someone with the, the, the scale and network and footprint of a premier investment. So how do you, you cover Shaper Shop, um, how do you see that when, when you speak to them, how is their outlook around opening new stores versus the percentage of online? You said before, yeah. you know, 40% of their sales are now online. Yeah. Um, how do they see it going forward? Yeah. Like how do you model that going yeah. forward? Clearly it's not going to be maintained at 40% or even though they'd love that to happen. Mm. Um, it's going to revert back to where it was pre-COVID, which I think it was the last number was 18%, which is historically a very, very high number for Australia, because I said earlier, the average retailer in Australia is 10 to 12% of their sales being online. Yeah. So they're already at 18% because they'd invested ahead of the curve two years ago. So they are still investing in their physical store network. They're currently at about 120 stores. They want to get to 150. Okay, so, and that's why in the next three, four years. So it's a gradual rollout rather than an accelerated rollout. And really you've got to find the demographics to open stores. You know, typically you want to be in an area where there's over 100,000 population in that demographic or regional area, and there's still plenty of pockets in Australia that can do that. So it's a really strategic rather than accelerated footprint. And 150 is, is, is really the max where most small discretionary retailers get to in Australia. Do you think, so retail most do, you said 10 to 12% yep. online. Do you see that number changing yep. going forward? Kogan's doing, uh, sorry, Shaver Shop's doing 40. Yep. Um, yep. You know, where does that number settle for retail? And what does it settle in terms of tying back in supermarkets and things? Yep. You know, where does that number settle? So pre-COVID, it was increasing 100 bips or 200 bips per annum. So one to two percentage points, mm. you know, went 10, if you go back five years ago, we we're at 5%. Now we're at say 10, let's call it 10%. By all accounts, not only our research, but independent research says it should accelerate its growth profile as a percentage of sales in the next five to 10 years because of COVID and because that's what the customer is now demanding. So all the forecasts I've, I've seen in the next five to 10 years, it should effectively double from 10 to 20%. Yeah. And that we're seeing that being borne out now in the UK. US is a little bit slower than, than other regional areas, but it's also happening in, in Europe as well, where you're seeing that acceleration of, of online as well. So in, in a business like JB Hi-Fi, I know you don't cover this stock, um, but you know, they've obviously benefited from a yeah. few things, work from home phenomenon, they've obviously, um, you know, people going out there spending money on IT to set up home offices, et cetera. Um, you know, you think about your Google employees globally, yeah. they're gonna be at home till yeah. middle of next year. My yeah. wife works for a large multinational, they're not, yeah in work um, this year at the very earliest. Um, you know, that business has run from 22 bucks or the share price has run from 22 to 44. How do you reconcile it here? So I'm a very big fan of JB Hi-Fi. Okay, I think they've done several things that are really attractive. The first one is they've really engaged, not the customer, but their staff. I mean, they've engaged the customer as well, but the staff are incredibly engaged. There, um, and there are certain staff, aren't there? Absolutely. Type of, type yep. of staff. They're energetic. They know the products inside out. Uh, they, that's the first point. The second point... But is, you don't get that online, though. No, so you don't. You can't replicate that online. Correct, which is why they love people coming into the stores and the promotions are so, you know, activist and they're so mm. popular and et cetera. The second thing that they've done really well is in terms of their operating expenses or what the industry calls the cost of doing business, they're the lowest in the market. Yeah, which, so, which has made their margins sublime. And that's right. what the, the bare thesis on JB was, you know, global um, uh, electronic retailers yeah. were had margins a lot similar than JB. Yeah. They must come down. Yeah. 
Is that right. But they've stayed resilient. They've stayed resilient both on a gross margin perspective, which is what the market looks at for retails, but also on an EBITDA margin. So they've been really, really focused on, most retailers focus on the margin, i.e. Yeah. the price and the volume. They don't focus on the cost side. JB have been very smart by looking at both of them. So you have what's called the positive jaws effect. Mm -hmm. Okay, so where your costs come down, but your top line goes up. And so that increases your margin. So they've been very, very smart on that front. And they invested in online, and they've invested in Click and Collect. Okay, now Click and Collect has had a checkered history here in Australia the last 12 months. It's interesting that during COVID, most retail franchises or most retail businesses shut down their Click and Collect, okay? Because it's still relatively new here. The third thing that JB Hi-Fi have done really well is when they bought good guys, they bought that really cheaply. It's a big white goods offering. At the time it was poo-pooed poo because it was seen as very heavily tied to the residential sector. But it looks like they're turning and transitioning that business around. So that'll be very positive for them as well. So that gives them an additional channel in terms of customer profile. Yeah. So they've been very smart on that front as well. And the fourth piece of the puzzle is, is New Zealand, which is starting to turn around for them as well. Now the other big comp, probably the fifth point, the JB Hi-Fi, has done really well is what is generally accepted to be probably the key metric that the market looks at with retailers. And that is what's called the like for like sales growth number or the comparable sales growth number. Which is the sales growth in the same store. Yeah, for so it takes out all new stores or closed stores. Yeah. So you, you're comparing like with like. And they've been, that, that has been very, very positive for them as well. You know, the, the, so. They've done a few things really well. They've had a very consistent management team. Their inventory management and inventory turns are really good as well. They incentivize their staff, which is another key differential between them and other discretionary retailers. Big fan of JB Hi-Fi. And for me personally, I far prefer that to say Harvey Norman. Yeah. So in turn, just summing up on this, on the discretionary retail side for those listening out there, one of the things that um, Danny's just mentioned one of the things that I tend to look for is, you know, revenue growth, but yep. maintaining margins yep. as you can Gross as money. you can grow revenue, gross margins when you're attaining, when you're growing your, your top line. Because that's, you know, you see a lot of retailers just selling for selling sake, selling to grow volume. the top line, volume, 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 and then the margins will come. So there's a there's a fine. I mean, yeah. Kogan had low margins when okay. they came out. And, and, it was all volume. Had, yeah. and it was all volume. And now he's fixed his margins yeah. up as time has gone by. But when you're looking at a retailer that's on market, that's got some size already, yeah. um, then look at those um, couple of things. So And the other big advantage with 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 Kogan and, to, and really JB Hi-Fi is the threat from Amazon I don't see it as a significant issue, particularly for JB Hi-Fi. And largely because when you look at the goods that are on Amazon in the US, it tends to cater to that lower commoditized price category. So it's yeah. looking for cheap things. Whereas the JB Hi-Fi, if you want your, you know, your $700 headphones or your $5,000 TVs, that customer is not likely to, to go on Amazon to get those. You know, they want the $400 TV and the, and the $20 cheap made in China headphones. Gee, the market gets concerned about specific things. Yeah. So the supermarkets, yeah. it was Aldi, it was yeah. all the other. Cowfland. Uh, yeah, coming over and, and cutting um, our supermarkets yeah. grass. Um, in all these uh, retailers, electronics retailers, yeah. et cetera, it was Amazon. And that just hasn't proven, you know, that hasn't proven to be the case. Yeah. And is unlikely to be the case. In I think years. so. Look, I think so because... Australia is distinguished by its idiosyncratic geography. Okay, we're a continent that is surrounded by water that is geographically dispersed. We're not like Europe, we're not like the USA, we're not like any other continent really. It is really, really difficult here when 75% of your population is on the eastern seaboard. It is very, very difficult to do business here. This is why Cowfland ex extricated themselves from Australia. They couldn't get the supplier agreements that Woolworths and Coles had had locked in for the last 10 years. They couldn't get their head around same day delivery given our dispersed geographical landscape. They couldn't get their head around the high penalty rates here and the high labor costs, the high gas costs relative to the US, for example. So that's why they exited the Australian market. It's a complete, and this is why Woolworths and Coles- It's a hard market. Yeah, it's why Woolworths and Coles effectively have 75% share here, which is unique globally. If you look at it in the UK, oh, there's four the players country. that have 75% market share. If you go to the US, <laughs> I guess there's like yeah. 10 that have 75%. So they're much more fragmented markets. So Woolworths and Coles have not only first mover advantage, but they've got that footprint and that capital heavy model to really have locked up that. And that's why it took Aldi 20 years to get go from zero to 15% market share. And Aldi have basically said from here on in, 
it's very, very difficult for them to grow market share. What was your, what's, your, what's your number one pick? Or just, you know, for not, not from a, a, a research recommendation yeah. point of view, what do you reckon looks really interesting here in a discretionary retailing space? One stock, two, I'll expand it to. You know, what do you, what do you find most interesting? Oh, to put you on the spot. spot yeah, look, look, I think the perfect mix of bricks and mortar plus the transition to online is a business like JB Hi-Fi. I think that's a fantastic business. And it's not on a huge multiple like, you know, the, the, mm. the premier investments or, you know, the, the, the BWXs or McPherson. It's only on about 15 times mm. consensus earnings. Thanks to Market Matters subscribers will know we bought this well oh, in March and we sold it. Um, <laughs> we sold it about 10 bucks ago. Yeah. So um, we've played that one really well. In, so in, in I, I like that hindsight. business. I, um, if you, you know, number two, I still like Nick Scali. I think Nick Scali yeah. is, is, is arguably one of the preeminent re quality retailers in Australia. They've proven that over the last 10 years. Haven't they? They just consistent keep... like for like sales That's... growth, consistent maintain, maintenance of gross margins above 60%. In fact, they're 62, 63% at the moment. It's, it's huge. Anthony's just a smart operator, increased sourcing from offshore, mm. you know, in, decreasing their, their raw materials costs, you know, leather costs, vinyl costs, mm. fabric costs. He's just a super smart operator in that mid tier space, um, so I still like that uh, them long term. Um, All right, we'll leave it there. We'll let you think about this. Anyway, let's get on to um, payments. So you think about um, obviously the big end of town in terms of um, retail and the future of retail, the discretionary retailers, there's big, small, and medium in there. It's all underpinned by. Payments. So, payment systems. you know, the, 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 the days that people go and pay things for cash, I uh, pay for something with cash yesterday and the girl behind the counter uh, looked strangely at me. I mean, that was, I know we're in a different um, sort of landscape at the moment with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, but it's, it's changed the shift towards online payment, um, what we've been through, but it's a shift that was already happening. Correct. That has been accelerated by COVID. You're absolutely right, James. So this is, a, this is really... The catalyst here was a generational mindset shift. Okay, it's the millennials 18 to 30 years old who increasingly didn't want to use cash, increasingly didn't want to use credit cards, increasingly, as was borne out by the Royal Commission, were distrustful of the big four banks, let alone going into a big four bank mm. or having a big four bank account. Uh, what they wanted and what they demanded was a frictionless payment system. And this is where buy, uh, buy Now, Pay Later came to the fore. And as you know, it's been the hottest sector or subsector in the technology mm. sector here in Australia in the last 12 months. So that fluidity and that frictionlessness is now moving out of the young demographic, those millennials into now the older groups. And we're now seeing Buy Now, Pay Later payment providers who are targeting 40-year-olds and over. We're seeing a whole avalanche of this. And this is still, and Australia's been the early adopter globally in this space. We've been the innovator in this space. Yeah, which is, which is a great, you know, a, a great phenomenon. But you look at, so we see in Australia and we often get very um, Aussie centric here in Australia. And I look at, I, I try and um, take a step back and we look more in it, look at more of the international experience to gain some perspective on what things look like internationally and the size of the businesses can grow. Um, you know, um, Afterpay listed in 16, I think it had a, a listed with 160 million market cap. I think it's a $20 billion market cap. It's on hot on the heels of Coles, now, which is extraordinary when you think about it. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. It's, it's absolutely phenomenal. Well, you were just talking about JB Hi-Fi. I think Afterpay um, is um, four or five times yeah, bigger than right. JB yeah. Hi-Fi, which is pretty phenomenal. All in the space of three years. <laughs> yeah, but then you think about it in the context of what the US like what the, the global opportunity is and how technology businesses like this, yeah. um, you know, you prove up something, yeah. then you can take it yeah. globally. And we are just such a small market. So you sort of justify, you've got to keep um, pinching yourself and saying, you know, think of bigger picture in terms yeah. of these businesses. And I've got to say that we um, absolutely didn't um, think bigger picture enough yeah. in terms of the buy now. Yeah pay later space early. Um, we've got zip in our portfolio. Now we've been in and out of open pay. Um, uh, so, you know, we've got some exposure to it now, but you know, how does it, the buy now pay later space look going forward? Like, is it just the start? Absolutely. So there's a few things, James, that you, you said in your comments. So the first one is, even though it's a relatively new sector here in Australia in the last three years, there have been global offerings previously that were in train, albeit, they didn't have the technology 
uniqueness and frictionless of the afterpays. And the simple, simple, so you the had, simple concept. Yeah, so you had Flexi Group, which has been listed for a long time. They've gone through several iterations, Surgy, OxyPay, now they've got Hum, which is sort of like a, a pseudo buy now, pay later product. Globally, you've got Affirm and Klarna, two big uh, payment mm -hmm. providers who are in this but space. CBA has okay. an interesting Klarna. So, and then three years ago, you had Afterpay, Zip, um, in the last couple of years, you've had open pay, sizzle, and split it. So you've got five listed players here in Australia. So is it two? Is, it, is that, you know? I don't buy the argument that there's too many now. And we know, I, I know personally, I've seen three or four that, that, are, that are looking at potentially at IPO in the next six months. Mm. The reason I say that is we've got four major banks plus a whole bunch of other regional banks. We've got several credit card providers. There's no reason why you can't have similarly multiple buy now, pay later players at the point of sale, the POS, mm. okay? Now, they've been incredibly successful here in Australia, all of them, okay? But as you alluded to in your comments, the US, the UK, Europe are significantly more leveraged and larger markets mm. than Australia. And that is, that is the next prize. Right now, it's a land grab, okay? So the number one and number two players have been Afterpay and Zip here in Australia. Afterpay's just moved into the US, 330 million population. If they can just get ten percent of that population, mm. you know, thirty odd. Million. What are they? They've got they've got about they've got ten million customers now. They have got thirty percent of millennials here in Australia, so more than one quarter here. Mm. So ten percent is a very small reach for the US. If they can get that, the sky's the limit. And that's just in the US. They're moving into Canada. They're moving into the UK. They're moving into Europe as well. The land grab is massive, and right now, it's, it, and that's what it is. And they're taking share away from those old legacy incumbents who have refused to change, i.e. the Klanas, the Affirms. Now, they're also big in the US, but you'll see Afterpay only went into the US six months ago and they've already got 9.9 .9 million customers, mm. half of which, 5 million, have already started using the service. Okay. Zip have now moved in via QuadPay, via yeah. an acquisition. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's why Zip re-rated um, on the back of that acquisition. They've bought QuadPay. QuadPay's yep. got 1.8 million yep. customers over yep. in the US, growing pretty well, 1.5 when they bought it, now 1.8, yep. growing strongly. Is that, and so it's all about just growth in the US. It's all about growth in the US, and the market isn't just captive to one player. You can feasibly have three, four, five. If they can succeed here in Australia, where we've got a, a multiple number, you've got five listed already, plus Flexi Group. In the US, you could easily do 10. I don't see that as an issue long term. The structural change and the intrinsic transition in Australia and the US and in the UK into buy now, pay later, and the lessening risk of regulation around these products says to me that this trend is going to continue and there's no reason why you can't have multiple offerings. So what it, so you look at Afterpay and you look at Zip, which is on the screen um, for, those for, for those viewing it, you know, these guys had their massively volatile share prices. So we get caught up in, you know, we write a daily note, our subscribers <laughs> read a daily note, you get caught up in the day-to-day the -day ebbs and flows of share prices. But do, you, do we need to step back and think a little, little bit, um, I, I don't want to get caught up in the longer term, but think yeah. about the opportunity ahead and not get caught up in the day-to-day -day of these. Absolutely. It's very businesses. difficult when you work in the industry because, as you said, you're either in front of a Bloomberg or an Iris or a fact set all day, and mm. it's hard to put that noise aside. As I said, credit cards still have the bulk of spend in Australia. Yeah. In fact, it's not credit cards. When you look at point of sale data, it's debit cards, then credit cards. So that card infrastructure is still the dominant form of payment system here in Australia. We're only now transitioning in, in, into that embryonic stage through these buy now, pay later providers. There is a long, long trajectory to go. Mm. But th there's no doubt in my mind that that is where the market is heading. And this is where these businesses go. This is why the zips and the afterpays and the open, open pays, they aren't so much focused on the bottom line in terms of achieving cash flow break even or, or earnings or profitability. It's about reinvesting into that global franchise, that global footprint to win those markets, yeah. to get that scale. Because right now, buy now, pay later is all about the number of customers you're acquiring, the number of merchants you're acquiring, and that translates into your TTV, your total transaction value. And then obviously the buy now pay later players take a percentage cut both from the customer and the and the re, and the merchant of that.
Yeah, and the, the concept of looking at these on an earnings multiple and all of that, the traditional metrics is just completely, absolutely, completely irrelevant in this sort of scenario. I know people will be concerned about saying, well, it doesn't matter, they're not, not making money. Yeah. That's a um, sort of a, a, an interesting way to look at it. But the, the fact is, a lot of these are making you know, strong gross profits. They're just reinvesting Correct. in those. Correct. Um, you know, reinvesting for future growth. We've seen it in other tech businesses. Yeah. I mean, you see it in Amazon in the first instance. You see it in um, Zero as a company we hold in our portfolio. They're doing exactly that. They're grabbing yeah. customers. It costs money to grab customers. Correct. But if you can prove something up from an online perspective, that's the key. So That is absolutely right. And we saw that three years ago with SaaS. So software as a service companies that were listed here in Australia. None of, not many of them were, were profitable. Look at them now, after all that global reinvestment, you know, the, I'm talking about the likes of WiseTech, the likes of Altium, Zero, which you mentioned, Hanson Technologies. Mm. You know, it's, it's exactly the same thing. It's investing ahead of the curve, getting global reach, and then finally you'll see that positive jaws come mm. through. So in our own business, we've been, we've been investing in, and subscribers haven't seen it yet, um, new website, new IT back end. But what excites me, um, from our own business, and this is just a small example of it. It doesn't. It excites me when you, um, a subscriber, finds you online and goes through and actually subscribes to your service with no human touch. So that is a that's a scalable model. When you yeah. put a human in there, when you put a phone call in yeah. there, or you put a, you know, that actually that 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 breaks that correct. Um, you know, the ability to prove up and scale yeah. something. So um, there's a lot of businesses out there that are trying to prove those up. Yeah. You look at Temple and Webster, some yeah. tweaks in their business. Correct. They started off, I think, with three websites selling different yeah. things. Um, it didn't work. They, you know, they've gone from twelve cents to eight bucks. It's a you know, if you can get it right, but there'll be a lot that won't get it right. Yeah, absolutely, that's the thing. And you know, retailers always have something to complain about. Okay, so even before COVID, there, every year you can go back the last decade, and there've, there's been multiple collapses every year. Okay, but you're absolutely right. The end prize is significant if you listen to the customer, and. We're not even, I'd say we're probably only 60, 70% of the way there in terms of retailers here in Australia because a lot of them still don't have loyalty systems in place. They don't have social media sales outlets. They don't have CRM implementations, which really collect customer analytics. That's where the JB Hi-Fi's and Kogan have done really, really well. Not only do they have massive data banks from their customers, they know how to use it. They know how to tailor a newsletter, an email newsletter or an ad on your phone to you about a product that you may have searched on Google. or Personalization or in scale. Whole personalization. We are still well behind the eight ball here. And that's why a lot of these high premiums are attached to companies like Kogan and to JB Hi-Fi, because they've got that part of the puzzle right. And all these pieces are gonna to come together in the next five, 10 years. They're going to be the survivors. It's the old business models that have refused to change, or maybe not refused to change, but have found it difficult to adapt or difficult to change. Maya, for example, so, that are struggling. I'll, I'll get on to Maya in a sec. So we haven't, we've only touched on the buy now, pay later space yeah. in the payments um, sphere. There's a lot more um, other meat on the bones in terms of payments. We don't really have time to get to it um, now. We're running to five o'clock, so I won't keep anyone a lot longer. But I've got a barrage of questions um, that um, I'll fire at Danny from um, listeners out there. I'll probably, well, only get to a few of these. So apologies if um, we don't get to all of them. Maya was a question um, that came through. You know, what's the fate of Maya going forward? You know, what, 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 what does Maya do from here? My short answer is it sounds pretty dire. I, personally, I don't think there's enough population in Australia, that 26, 26 million in Australia, to support two significant department stores. Now, DJ says it's higher tier and Maya says it's, it's, it's that medium tier, but the reality is there's a lot of cross cannibalization between the two businesses. Okay, so that's the first point. Second point is you look at Maya and you look at their sales over the last 20 years, they've basically been flat. They've there's had the multiple, share price of Maya on the screen there. They've had multiple iterations. Maya have largely become irrelevant to the consumer. We'll leave it that, at that. Yeah. Stay away from Maya. Basically, there's no, it's not a, not a huge. Um, okay, so it, what's your um, view in terms of stronger Aussie, the impact of a stronger Aussie dollar, dollar uh, on retail, um, Harvey Norman, JB Hi-Fi, West Farmers? Yeah, it's the FX currency and sensitivity. You go for it. It, um, it is a big, big issue, particularly those with overseas earnings. You know, you can include premier investments and all those. So 
you're absolutely right because a lot of Australian retailers buy goods in US dollars, for example. Um, so it does have a flow on effect in terms and uh, the FX expense and the sensitivities and how, what their hedging policies are mm. is a critical factor. So in someone like a JB, yep. it's a positive for them in yep. terms of a higher Aussie dollar. Yep. Harvey Norman, it's a yep. positive for them in terms of the yep. um, higher Aussie. West Farmers, I presume, Bunning. Yeah. yeah. But there's a few um, swings and roundabouts yep. in terms of... But a good retailer, you know, c can survive when the Aussie dollar was a dollar. Yeah. If you go back a few years back. So. But that's the thing. You can't control those... The, Correct. those external no you know, and that's why the market tends to look at above the line yeah. issues which is why they look at gross Constant, margin yeah. for example so yeah um what's your view on do you know much about um bubba alibaba we've got this in in uh in our uh, international alibaba yeah look alibaba is effectively the amazon of the east yeah. uh, asian amazon hey? the asian amazon look they don't have the protocols and, and the prudential regulations that say an Amazon has, but they are absolutely massive. You know, when you look at their exposure, not only to China, but to India, Indonesia, etc., it's a significant business. And like Kogan, they're moving into all these other vertical channels, yeah. such as, you know, insurance, personal loans, etc., etc. So my view on Alibaba is it's in the right space at the right time. It's effectively a mirror of what Amazon are doing in the US. Amazon will struggle against them in, in the Asian market. There's no doubt about that. Uh, that's all I can really say on that. Um, there's a question here on AX1, which is... Yeah. Um, I used to cover a, it. Yeah. It used to be our RCG, a, so cent. Athletes Accent. Yeah, so it used yeah. to be um, Athletes Foot. Fantastic business. So the previous CEO that ran that ran, ran a jewellery business, which did really, really well. Um, then came into Athletes Foot. Now, what's interesting about Athletes Foot is it was always a bricks and mortar store. They didn't want to do online. They really pushed up against doing online because they wanted people to go in, get, get fitted, fitted, and get the full service. Yes, and they never discounted. So, you know, they were never in that market where if you wanted a brand new pair of sneakers, that you know they'd take 30, 40, 50 percent off, like if you go to any of the other uh, providers. Now they've quickly shifted to online and they've done really well. So that's the first thing they've done. Then they bought these whole bunch of brand, uh, other brands, you know, Doc Martens and um, it's Merrill's yeah. and all these other brands. So I'm a big fan of AX1. They have shown that they've been able to adapt very quickly and nimbly in the last two years. Mm. All right. Like AX1. Um, in terms of, there was a question here on luxury goods. Yeah. Where do you see the luxury going? Obviously, yeah. much larger margins. Yeah. Um, but lower volume, higher margin yep. business, um, obviously exposed to the growth in yep. the middle class in yep. China, et cetera. Yep. What, what's your take there? Okay, I presume the question's related to international luxury because yeah. with the with, with uh, we Oriton, that, well, we used to, <laughs> Oriton was sort of mass luxury, but uh, <laughs> not anymore. But uh, so we had two really interesting data points overnight in international luxury. We had Salvatore Ferragamo, who came out with a quarterly result yesterday. And we had LVMH. So LVMH is the big kahuna in this space. They own a whole suite of brands, including Louis Vuitton, you know, various um, Christian Dior brands, uh, Givenchy, plus they've got a wine and spirits portfolio, uh, two biggest sh selling champagnes globally, uh, Moët de Chandon and Verve Clicquot, which is 60% of the market. Um, they've got a whole bunch of watch brands, etc. So they... Salvatore Ferragamo and LVMH overnight has said exactly the same thing, and that is Asia is rebounding. Okay, so we've seen an improvement from March to April to May. The June improvement has been the best month, and that's carried on into July. So that's the first point. Second point is the China market is critical to most of these luxury players. Okay, so if you want to invest in luxury, you've got to be very comforted by the fact that... Um, that you're comfortable with the China economic situation. We've seen that that can turn very quickly in the case of treasury wine estates, for example. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you'd call them luxury, but they're, they're luxury pricing in terms of their wine portfolio. Some of them is, yeah. Yeah, some of them are. Um, be very wary. My view is um, LVMH is a fantastic global company. They know how to work social media. They know how to work online, whether it be Sephora or through their, their key brands. They're very strong in business development management. They've got a global franchise. They've got an incredible strong suite of brands that only that aren't just only focused on Japan and in China, but globally. So I'm a big fan of LVMH. Look, 
All right. Nice one. Um, we've got questions on um, the impact of Amazon, um, coals and woolies, etc. We've touched on that, so I'll, I'll pass through that. Um, what's your take on super retail um, yeah. in terms of moving online? We own super retail, bought it into the March panic in our income focused portfolios. Yeah. Um, it's been going well. Yeah, I, I, I covered that for many years as well. So if you look at the core brands, they're, they're the core super cheap auto business, really, really good business. Mm. Good beneficiary of what's been happening during yeah. COVID, guys upgrading their cars, all that sort of stuff. So that business is now back on track post the cost outs and, and the improvements in margins that they've incorporated in the last 12 months. Then you look at, say, Rebel Sports, Rebel. for example. When they first acquired that business, probably, geez, seven, eight years ago now, yeah. it was very, very low margin, three, four percent margins. They've really turned that business around. Again, we're seeing this whole health and well-being trend play out globally. Mm. So Rebel has been a big beneficiary of that. Then you've got the BCF or the uh, the Matt outdoors Pack, yeah. business, Matt Pack, for example. That's another big growth driver for them. You know, it's on trend in terms of where the market mm -hmm. is heading. That whole outdoor facility. We've seen Kathmandu has been one of the best performers as a, as a comp to them. So really good work done there. Um, the issue has been really around the cannibalisation between BCF, boating, yeah. camping, fishing, and raise outdoors, and they're they're addressing that right now. Um, so. Longer term, I think they'll get it right. It's not on a huge multiple. Mm. Historically, they've had a really good track record of management, um, improving the business. So positive on SQL. And it SQL. seems to me that that's the, the products that they're retailing is really lends themselves to online. So, right. yeah. Um, yeah, and you look at, you know, car, the, obviously the car space yep. is really um, uh, lends itself to online. So. Yep. Yeah, super retail. Yeah. Uh, I like it. If you're looking yeah. from a, I was looking at it today when we were writing in the right our, areas. our income um, report today. It's it is on a, a a reasonable multiple. I think it's cheap for what you're getting. Yeah. Um, I think from a technical perspective, now we've had um, about a couple of months now, or a couple of weeks, I should say. That's a weekly chart up there, just of consolidation. So if I'm, you know, if I'm a, a shorter term trader of that stock. Um, that is going up to new highs every day of the week from my perspective. So um, just looking at it from a purely technical standpoint. So that's why we're continuing to hold super retail. I think we're up 40, 50% on the position. So, but we're going to continue to hold um, that stock. Look, I've got the, the, there's, there's another 20 odd questions here. So I apologize that we can't get to all of the questions. It's gone over time, but um, thanks very much, Danny, for joining us. It was great it's to get your insights um, on the webinar today. We had a lot of people on the webinar um, and, uh, and nearly everyone stayed till the end. So um, thanks for joining us to all our subscribers um, out there. We'll do another one again soon. Hope you enjoyed it. Bye for now.